is so great you all decided to come inside on this gorgeous day. <laughs> and um, as um, you know, I'm from this city, very dysfunctional city, Washington, D.C., but I remain hopeful, um, partly because of people like uh, these amazing change agents who not only are thinking about doing things, but they now are really at the cusp of really looking to change relations with police, racial stereotyping, uh, many, many other issues that you're going to hear about. Um, and be for the sake of time, I'm really going to do as best a job as I can to put duct tape, invisible duct tape, over my mouth. And I really want to begin by having each of our panelists share just a few highlights. Um, these are not prepared, uh, beautifully polished. I hope they're gritty and granular. And you tell us, um, and in our question and answer and discussion, we're really going to talk about the challenges that so many young people face. Because often adults pretend to listen, pretend to respect, but fail to do so. So one of our youngest panelists is Jeremy Cahigas, uh, who is at the community in high school, correct? High school in the community. Uh, thank you very much. That's just what I want, correction, override, OK? Um, and Jeremy was telling me how Trayvon Martin is one of the reasons he is here. He is working so hard. Fear, fear alone. And um, he has a very interesting story about his uncle losing his life because he was mistakenly shot and killed by a policeman. And his family has had to deal with Jeremy, who is really trying to navigate a new direction with police in a very positive way. So if we could hand it over to Jeremy, who one of his taglines is the power to the rising generation. Jeremy. Um, so like Wendy said, my name is Jeremy Cajigas. I'm a 16-year-old um, community organizer and activist over at high school in the community. Um, also the founder of a group at the high school called um, Eliminating Racial Profiling. Um, and what we try to do is build up the relationship between minorities, um, African-American community, and police officers, breaking the stereotypes that not all cops are bad and, you know, Looking at both sides of the story, um, a lot of times we only see what the media shows us and we only see the bad cop on TV, but we don't get to see the good cop that's actually doing his job. And what we like to also do is go into the police academy and interact with the police officers and show them that not all us African Americans and Hispanics are criminals and thugs. Um, and to close me out, I'll, I'll perform a spoken word that I wrote called, I am a young colored man. <coughs> In their eyes, I seem to be a criminal, a thug, a killer, because the media has told them so, when I really am a young colored man in America who daily deals with being profiled and put into stereotypes, when I really am a young colored man in America who daily fears with being brought up with racism, sexism, and classism, when I really am a young colored man in America trying to survive another day in my shoes shoes that over the years went from slave shoes to stereotype shoes. America. America's post-racial era feels like this era's new slavery. While I'm still singing like my ancestors, I just want to take the chains off. America, see me for who I really am and not who I've been stereotyped to be. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> tremendously. Um, Montrell Morrison um, is um, closing out his education at South Southern Connecticut Southern. State Keep going. Come on. I'm, I'm dependent. <laughs> Thank you. See, I really yes. want this help. Um, Montrell has done so much, including being the founder and organizer of an annual NAACP Juvenile Justice Expo. Expo something that he started and is passing the torch, which is one of the things we're going to talk about. There's this thing that happens. You have a young person like Jeremy 
who's 16? What happens when he's 18 and moves to another community? How does he pass the torch to younger students? We're going to talk about that. Montrell has done that in a beautiful way. He's eventually on to law school, uh, but really has a lot to teach us today about his work in a very comprehensive look at restorative justice. So please help us and just shed a little light, Montrell, on your work now. Thank you, awesome. Wendy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Like Wendy stated before, my name is Montrell Morrison. Um, I spent the last two years at, um, as the SCSU NWACP Juvenile Justice um, Chair, and I am the founder of the Juvenile Justice Expo. Basically, that is an expo that highlights the issues of um, youth topics and brings it to one place. Um, a lot of times, we don't know the issues of young people unless there's a tragedy. So the Expo helps do, does that in a, in a correctly, uh, correctly manner, where it's not tragically, but people can learn in an educational but interactive manner about the numerous issues that are, um, affect young people. Uh, to addition to that, I'm currently a mentor to the Gangs of Dads program, which I am currently a mentor to and been for the past two years. And um, my first, well, my first mentee and I, we won a video for $10,000. And um, that's a great video to, um, to see that I'll be showing quickly. Um, and so, let's show it, please. I'm not a bad kid. At least I try hard not to be. But sometimes, I guess I don't try hard enough. Sometimes, I find a lot to do other than what I should be doing. I get off track. I get distracted and lose my focus. I know I could be doing a lot better, especially in school. Some days, I just need somebody to talk real talk with. Somebody who can tell me and show me stuff that a man needs to know. Now, don't get me wrong. My grandma loves me. I know she does. And I'm thankful for her. But sometimes, I just feel like she doesn't always get me. With the mentor, I not only get to just hang out and have fun, but at the end of the day, I always learn something too. And he holds me accountable. But when he thinks I'm making excuses or a big mistake, or just lacking off, he tells me in a heartbeat, and I appreciate it. All I can say is, it works. Mentoring works for me. And if it worked for me, it'd work for you too. Give it a shot. It could only help. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as you can see from the video, I'm a great proponent of um, restoration justice instead of punitive justice, which includes the uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, that video right there with Chris Menti, Jason Frazier, which was 15 at the time, now 16. Uh, we beat numerous cities to, to take home the $10,000 grand prize, including New York City, Philadelphia, cities in Maine, New Hampshire, and other states. So thank you, Wendy. And you're also um, working on a book. Yes, ma'am. And the title, the forthcoming title is? Uh, young Brothers of Colors. Basically, that's a book that highlights all the issues that some young brothers um, face in the inner city, like gr growing up in single parent households, um, facing um, youth violence, having your friends killed, um, while dealing with your basic school challenges, peer pressure, and other things that affect young people in their daily lives that is not brought to the table, like I said, unless a tragedy takes place. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Montreal. Thank you, Isabel Andreana Bate is, um, uh, has a wonderful expression she talked to me about, which I'm, I'm stealing. Uh, it's co-leading. She's been co-leading LGBTQ plus youth kickback here in New Haven for three years. And one of the wonderful things we're going to talk about, which is certainly universal to all grassroots movements, um, is relationships and how uh, the first step, and Carolina also will talk about this, there's, you can't replace that. There are no shortcuts. And she has done tremendous work, and we're going to spend some time talking about the three-pronged uh, policy agenda that you have focused um, on safety, on homeless young people, as well as jobs. And the other thing, again, which is a common thing for all of these four agents, is their work in coalition, multi-generational coalition, which can be difficult because people like me tend to love to override, to overrule, and co-opt. And you're not letting that happen. 
Isabel. <laughs> That's a compliment, Isabel. Oh, definitely. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this platform. Um, so thanks to you, Wendy, and Arts and Ideas. Um, like she said, I'm Isabel Bate. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, by the way. Um, and I have been uh, co-leading uh, the LGBTQ youth kickback uh, for a little bit, and I've been involved for about three years, like you said. I started out doing um, like campaigns, local elections in the city, um, and then like soon after that, started organizing, getting involved with kickback. Um, and right now, our campaign, uh, the Speak for Yourself, safety, housing, and jobs are our three issues. I've talked to hundreds of people all across this city um, like young people, queer people, um, people of color, working class people, um, just everybody in New Haven. And the three issues that come up over and over again, safety, housing, and jobs. Safety, um, when I talk about that, it's like in your home, in the streets, uh, with mental health in your head. Um, when I talk about housing, I mean too many of my friends are homeless. 40%, um, I believe, of homeless youth are queer. Like whether that's just like housing instability, like being kicked out by your parents, like you know not knowing where you're going to spend uh, the night, like sleeping on people's couches, um, that's something that like I've seen um, personally. And with jobs, like there's an unemployment crisis in our city. The statistic lies around 20% unemployment for people of color. Like that's unacceptable, um, especially like living in a city with Yale University has an endowment of $25 billion. Um, and like, there's, there's money in our city. There are jobs here, um, but not enough go to New Haven residents. Um, so there's an introduction to my organization, myself, um, and our campaign. Uh, thanks to the AV team, I'd like to watch that now. When people see me, they see what they want to see. They don't see, you know, like what I what I really want. Um, they don't like, see me as a, a person. But also, like, come on, like ask me, ask me a question, or like, like get to know me. But so the majority of the time spending it um, in the exercise, Rory's going to lead us through um, and talking about uh, who we're going to uh, target and how we're going to talk to them. We created Kickback because we wanted a space that the most marginalized and discriminated against people in New Haven could access and feel comfortable in, but also build power in. Kind of in their infinite creativity, I uh, came up with a hashtag speak for yourself spelled R-Y-S-E-L-F, which was a point of contention among ourselves. Um, but we also wanted to open up to other suggestions. Um, okay, five, four, three, two, one. So, so I don't think that that was a good way of doing that. When people come into Kickback, they feel safe. They feel welcomed. They feel like they can be themselves. They can allow themselves to be vulnerable and honest. I think that we deserve, we deserve a space to feel that, right? Um, because what Kickback is really all about is about the relationships that we're creating with one another and realizing that like collectively like we can actually change the things in our community that we want to see differently. Nari! Nari! Hey! Oh, wait! Hey! Hey! Wait! Here, wait! Spin! Spin! What do you say? Spin! 
spin. <laughs> I do feel like I am like making a change and like I'm doing things that I can do that like benefit myself and like the people that I care about and like the people in my community um, is just like important to me and important to you people I think no I know I know um, I just wish that somebody would have supported me from the beginning like I wish that there was some place I could have gone to be like hey dude like I'm fucked <laughs> like I have no money I have like no really like job skills I like work at a grocery store I don't understand like taxes or insurance or any of that and like all I have is this backpack of clothes there there are people there who are in like the same situation I think that it can shit's hard you know and like it could be a lot easier I, we talk about like in order to like make safe spaces you have to like through vulnerability like demonstrate to other people like this space is safe enough for me to tell this story right now yeah. you know and like you did that in like a huge way like one of the biggest ways that i can think of so like thank you kickback is not just a space for learning it's a space for leadership development and for growth Every person who walks into Kickback, whether they stick around or don't, their lives are changed because of the just pure energy and enthusiasm that we have for making this city better. We're building different kinds of relationships and changing the way that we like, relate to each other and interact with one another um, in a way that's moving towards actual power and sustainability and like thinking really critically about like how we can be healthy and safe. We should have I'd love a space, funding, right, an understanding and relationship with the city, and recognizing the importance that, you know, LGBTQ plus people and youth have the ability to be leaders within their community. Travis Carbonella, um, who was a really, really wonderful videographer. Uh, again, an issue that I hope we can talk about is I think every single organization tries to create a safe, inclusive space for everyone. It's very hard to really have that happen. And so um, I think some of the lessons uh, from Kickback uh, will be very helpful to all of us in this room. And um, I'd finally like to introduce Carolina Bortoletto, uh, who moved here at age nine from Brazil. She is unafraid and undocumented. She uh, would be in Houston at the National Conference for United for a Dream. She's on their board of directors. She is one of the co-founders of Connecticut Students for a Dream. And again, a commonality between all of you is you talk beautifully about the importance of personal outreach, not just social media and, and pulling people together, the depth of building a group of, of concerted activists. But please share with us a bit, um, and then we'll start the conversation a bit more. Carolina. Hi, everyone. Um, like Wendy said, my name is Carolina Bortoletto. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Connecticut Students for a Dream, a statewide organization that works for the rights of undocumented students and undocumented families. Um, so, like Wendy said, I'm undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. And it takes, thank you, it takes a, it's been a long road for where people like me can stand in front of a, an audience and say that they're undocumented. Um, when I was in high school, I'm a bit older than the other ones, I think. When I was in high school, being undocumented was something that I just didn't tell people. Um, it was in high school that I found out like, what barriers being undocumented were throwing my way, that I couldn't get a driver's license, I couldn't get you know, a real job, I couldn't get scholarships within college. Um, so that's when I began to start to realize what being undocumented meant. 
because when you're undocumented, you feel like you have no voice really in society because you're taught, you're taught to like stay underneath the radar to not draw attention to yourself because one of the big parts of being undocumented is that you live in fear. And you live in fear that someone's gonna find out that you're undocumented, that something's gonna happen, it wouldn't be deported, like who knows what's gonna happen. So that's why I think organizations like Connections for a Dream that work with undocumented students is so important because it removes the fear from our community. Um, and you can think the better. So Connections for a Dream, we started in um, 2010 and our goals are to educate, advocate, and empower. So we want to educate what it means. We want to educate, we want to increase opportunities for higher education for undocumented immigrants. And then advocate, we work on the national level and the state level to, um, for immigrants' rights, whether that's immigration reform, access to higher education, stopping deportation, um, keeping families together. And then our main goal is to empower. We want to empower undocumented youth um, to you know, stand up for themselves, to live up to their full potential. Um, so that's what we do. And that's, those are my parents, by the way. That banner is from our Afford to Dream campaign. Our campaign for the last few years has been to increase access to higher education for undocumented students here in the state of Connecticut. Um, yeah, okay. So we've tried to include some art in all of these advocacy campaigns. And, um, and thank you all for starting this off. And I think so often, you know, when you, you basically ask people to give a quick synopsis of what they've done, normally they drone on and on. And I tell you, this was not rehearsed. This is so perfect. Thank you all for just teasing us with wanting to know so much more about each of you. So I'd like just to throw it out. This is a question to, for all of you, but um, I'd like to start with Jeremy. You were saying back in seventh grade, you were really trying to do something about police relations. And you got totally, like some teachers did not support you. Um, what is it for all of you? It is so easy to just drown, to just, it's too bad out there. It's like, why bother? Who is going to listen to us? And so, Jeremy, what is it? What's that seed that drives you, even when people don't necessarily respect or listen to you? Um, what drives me the most is fear. Um, fear that I could be the next one um, in a case like Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice. Um, so before it ends up me being there, I want to be the one to change the system. I want to be the one to rebuild the trust between African Americans and um, the police officers. So that's what really pushes me on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others? What, what's, what's the seed? What's, you're not like everybody else. I mean, most people of all ages sit, don't do, gripe don't do. You all are the opposite. What, what is it? What is it? Yes. Well, I think Wendy is the leadership quality, you know? In all movements, in all times in society, I feel like um, you have to take a stand. In the 60s, it was Dr. King. You know, in the 90s, it was rappers and different other people who made change in that kind of firm. In 2000s, it's young people, whether it's Black Lives Matters, or different other movements, and um, you just have to take a stand. And to piggyback what Jeremy um, was saying, it does get a little, I would say, mind-boggling, the fact that you could be the next um, um, Trayvon or, or Tamir, but like I said, somebody has to um, break the cycle of um, being the victim and step up, and hopefully change will happen in the future, I would say. I think that, like, the spark that caused people to like, become involved is, well, like, for example, for me, like I said, being undocumented, you feel like you don't really have a voice. And then when I found out about the immigrant rights movement, I learned that there were all these people, you know, speaking up for the rights and fighting for the rights of their own rights and the rights of the family. And they, were, they had this, build this community and this empowerment around them. And I felt that there's, there was something that, like, I wanted to do. I wanted to have, build that community and empowerment for students. Um, being once you become, like, you see that there's a community similar to you fighting for the rights, um, you become, like, what do I say? 
like you find your voice, and once like marginalized people find their voice, it's very empowering. Like there's no turning back from that. Like once you find your voice, you wanna keep having a voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really agree with the piece on the community. Um, for me, like I've invested so much in the community, like the movement community, young people, um, and like it is like there is no turning back once you find that community because it just like it changes your life. Um, and like there are times when you know even I felt like like this is this is hopeless this is horrible like young people are facing so much um, in this city especially like um, and it's so so easy to feel hopeless or to feel devastated or alone um, scared and like when I feel like you know getting close to giving up there you know there are people all around me that I've invested in that can turn around and invest in me and um, won't, you know, don't let me, don't let me give up, so. So there is that sense uh, for all of you of solidarity as lo when you, when you at least have some close allies. For instance, Jeremy, you were saying you were doing a training with police on how they could better interact with adolescents, with teenagers in New Haven, and how you were sick then the other leader of the student youth-led group was not able to do it. So you found somebody else who was able to do this, which is a depth of, of you've got something, you've got a core leadership uh, really going. And so I'd like to come back to the safe space, the building relationships, the, uh, Carolina, the, you're, you're talking about the need not just to depend on a flyer, um, or social media to get people out. Um, Montreal, you've, you and you've organized all, all these summits. How do you get, how do you delegate? How do you engage other people? How do you, especially when you have every reason to be <coughs> apathetic and like, why do this? What, what are your secrets? Share them with us. Um, me personally is um, giving them different types of opportunities, not just, um, letting them speak like us, just speaking about the issue regularly, but letting them speak through um, poetry and speaking through the music. I find, especially over at my school, a lot of the kids don't like to do public speaking, but they're willing to go sing about the issue and they're willing to go um, do poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, especially this year, that's what we've done with them. We've opened more opportunities for them where they can come and do poetry and get their point across through their poetry. So truly, Art activism. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Thank you. Other thoughts about how how you know that was really helpful. Uh, some other yes, Carolina. Um, like in the immigrant rights movement and in your work also, it's very important to like build a safe space for people because especially for working like the undocumented population, people might be scared <coughs> to come to a meeting, come to an event because they don't know what's going to happen. So you want to build a safe space, and that's, it's hard to do, but it starts with building relationships with people, and the way that you like, engage people, for example, in an organization, like, the backbone of organizing is doing one-on-ones with people, we always say. You want to have individual meetings with people where you talk to them and you listen to them, so that's a way to build the relationship, because people won't, you know, might not come to like a march, like, declare their undocumented in front of like a crowd, but they'll, they'll meet with you and talk about what, is, what are their dreams, what are their hopes, like what do they want to see happen in society. And once people feel invested because you're listening to them, they, they want to get involved. And so that's a way to begin to create a safe space. Isabel, Montreal, want to chime in? Yeah, um, I really like what you said as well, uh, both of you, um, especially like giving people space to lead on their issues um, and in the way that they want, like with art or music. Um, and then, like, one of my, like, what keeps me coming back always or, um, is, is the relationships that I've built um, and the one-on-ones, like, as the foundation for that. <coughs> I agree, too. Um, and that's, that was one of the key points to the Juvenile Justice Expo. We brought the community in, and that's what changed it from a typical school event to a more of a unique interactive experience by bringing all community stakeholders into one scene and saying this is how we're going to deal with this issue, then just letting 
faculty and students deal with the issues, we brought everybody to the table, I would say. Yes, I certainly have found, um, I always <laughs> encourage young people when they're planning an event uh, that, for instance, is dealing with police relations or the school to prison pipeline, to get it outside just your own school, even if it's a good school, with very supportive teachers, because it's seen as this um, sort of just in, it's happening in the bubble of the school, and it needs to be in a community venue, if possible, so you're taken more seriously. Um, and so I think those are, are, are really valid um, points. Um, uh, and I was just going to build off something, and I lost my train of thought. But I would like to ask you um, a bit more about the spoken word, other art forms, uh, the banner uh, for Connecticut students. When you take that to the state house, what happens? What? What? Uh, how does that help the movement? Why is that important? Chance, every, all of that. Well, I think. Well, chants, I think, are very important. People get, like, in all of this year, people get excited to come up with chants, because I think, maybe there's something like, fine more about when you're chanting with people, like you, you become stronger than you felt you were when you, before you started chanting, if that makes sense, because you're, all your voices are joined together in one unison, and you feel like you're like a, more than just yourself. It builds solidarity chants. Mm -hmm. And chants are, like, not catchphrases, they're like catchphrases, so it's a way to get out, like your, I guess your point to the broader community in a way that's succinct and people pay attention. Like when um, the immigrant rights movement was trying to stop the deportations of, you know, undocumented young people, one that or stop the separation of families. One chance was Obama don't deport my mama. So that's something. It's mm -hmm. simple, but you know, it rhymes and it gets the point across really quickly. That you know. Families are scared they're going to be separated, that parents are, like, kids are leaving, they're coming back home, and the parents are not there anymore because they were deported. So it really draws home that, so, yeah. I was going <clears> to <throat> come to a point Jeremy um, was telling me before we got together, and that was how you were planning a summit um, at your high school, one of several, and you just called the mayor. And the mayor, you know, whoever, she happened to be there, and you ended up talking to Tony Harp. So how do you normally do all of you, like, just, you know, just go for it? Um, how many of you do that? Because I think we need to operate that way far more than going through all the proper channels. So do you always just pick up the phone and call the police chief? What's going on? Um, yeah, me personally, um, I'm fortunate to... Um, the school administration has already um, built relationships with these people. So for me, it only takes to get the phone number from administration, and I would just call directly myself instead of having to shoot an email. Um, and since this is my third year um, working on this, it's just easy for me to call directly myself and be like, hey, I need you at this event at this time. Could you be here? And they'll be there. <laughs> so you just tell the mayor what to do. Is that how it works? Um, so I, 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 am, I am curious, um, coming back again to Connecticut's uh, uh, um, Students for a Dream, when you go to the State House, you, you lined up so many allies and you had so much support of really all, many, many key legislators, it's still your latest legislative effort did not clear the legislative obstacle course. But how do you, and this goes to all of you, again, I think so many young people don't bother to get involved because they don't think anyone's gonna pay attention. It's like you, you're not, wait till you're an adult. But how, how does this work for all of you? How, do you? how have you managed to get people not to treat you like, you know, token planted pots, you know? Like, no, you are people to, de to be dealing with. We need your ideas. How does that happen? Well, actually, to go back to the point before about like, cold calling the mayor, I think that's why we need youth in activism and why it's the youth that carry forward. Like, change in society, really, because like you are less afraid to get out there and do something. Like if you, if you're older, I'm I'm older myself. I'm like, I'm 28, so I'm not youth anymore. But like when you're older, you you don't wanna 
you're more hesitant to put yourself out there because you want to do things to the right channels. Like, no, we got to do it this way. So if you want to contact the mayor, you should you know, reach out to his communications director or maybe his community liaison and then try to get in contact with that. But that, that's going to take too long. Whereas a youth, like someone who's young, like when I started the movement, I was like, no, let's just call the mayor. Let's go to the office and see what happens. They listen to us if we go there. So I think that's youth are fearless. So that's why I think youth carry forward the movement. <laughs> Yeah, I think realizing that um, young people are at the forefront of these fights and our issues are um, incredibly like, vital and our stories are vital to these movements. Um, and like I said before, in like investing um, relationships, like resources in young people, um, building leadership skills and just like allowing space for, for young people to lead is, is, the most important, is the most important way to just, you know, not be controlled or overrided or any other things that can happen. I would have to say just building relationships and um, just getting your name out there. I've been in this since I was 10 years old and I've been a <laughs> lot of, I've been a part of a lot of organizations and I met a lot of great people. And um, yeah, it's just about getting your name out. I really want advice on this. Um, I'm old. Um, and many of us who've been activists in different causes, I worked for Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers for a number of years, best job I ever had. Um, we need to move back. We need to really, truly make room. And, and some of you have had good relations with what I would consider very established adult-run organizations. NAACP would be a perfect example. Um, uh, Carolina was saying how in 2001, there were no youth immigrant activists. It was totally adult-run. What can you tell all of us, especially those of us who aren't quite uh, 28 or lower um, in age, how can we truly support you? How do we, what do we need to do, adult-run organizations and just adult allies? How can we be the most helpful besides giving lots of money to your efforts? <coughs> well, like in, oh, so in Connections for a Dream, we have like a community norm that we always do, which is step up, step back. So, yeah, step up, step back. So if you feel that you're talking too much, you step back a little bit to let others like participate and chime in, and if you're the kind of person who doesn't participate, then you step forward and step out of your comfort zone to participate. So I guess, like you said earlier, a lot of established organizations, adult organizations, are more likely to, you know, in, like intervene or like, I don't mind interrupt, but like want their viewpoint to be the one that, that gets carried out. So a way to be a good adult ally is to like, Check yourself if you're talking too much and step back and let the, the youth participate. Um, an organization, every time that we're in a meeting, if we see the people who are not, you know, talking or participating, uh, we always try to bring them in, like, you know, you there, like, we say their names, of course. So, like, what do you think about this? So, you want to engage participation from everyone, I think. And I, I, the... I, we need advice from each of you on this, okay? <laughs> yeah, I was the other piece of it to step up, just like. Mm -hmm. You know, realizing too that like my issues are important, so I have to take up more space. Um, like making people listen. Um, you know, like it isn't always just on the adults. Mm -hmm, um, true. Like it is to like allow space for that and to like help cultivate that um, like sense of power um, in the young people. But like it really is like on us as well, like for better or for worse, mm -hmm. to take up more space and advocate for ourselves. If I can say one more thing, exactly what you're saying, like the way that we take up more space in a good way, I think is by sharing your stories. Like mm -hmm. I know in our movement especially, sharing your story is very important because it turns something that's very political, like you know, immigration, into something more personal. And I think like at the Capitol, that's how we got so many allies, that we had all, you know, all people, remember, share their stories with people and that really, let people listen to you. Because even, you know, someone might be a politician, but they're still a person, and they still can connect with you uh, on like a personal level if you show your story. Um, I think that during this time, we're living in a lot of teenagers are speaking out about the issues, but 
they're not like they're not properly organized, and that's when adults step in and the organization step in to help them organize their voice correctly. Um, without the proper help, we can't get out there ourselves. Like me personally, these three years I've had to work by myself and with my group. But um, if I would have started off my first year with an actual adult there helping me, I think by now we would have been more out there. But this year we've worked along with the NAACP and the Citywide Youth Coalition. So organizations like this really help us get our voice out there. And I think that's what we need more. I would have to say um, help bring the other youth organizations together. Uh, I haven't been um, with Citywide Youth Coalition for a long time, Addis and Molina. That's why I, I admire their organization because they're trying to help bring the young people in the organizations in the city together. It's just like in the 60s. They was facing this big giant of racism and different kind of segregations and it was all reverence, but they all put their <coughs> titles and egos besides to, you know, to do things to try to get the mission done. And that's what we have to do. We have to all come together and fight this battle for young people, which is us, obviously. Which is us, and yes. Out in the audience, so. Well, on that note, let's open this up uh, for discussion, comments, questions. So if you'll please come to the, to the microphones. And because I am um, totally blind by the lights, if you all will please help me um, to, do we have anyone ready to speak up, to take a stand? Not quite yet? Somebody, please join us. All right, thank you. I see movement. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. Oh, is this on? Test? OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Jim Clifford. I actually spoke to some of the panelists before they began. I'm the director of a uh, program called Exploring Justice. And here's my question for you. Um, Wendy, like you, I, I, I'm old, and I've worked with young people for a long time. Can you each give me, or a couple of you give me, an example of where has an adult played the right role in inspiring you, and where has the where have you, as you said, uh, and maybe encouraged the stu the adult to to step back? Because I'm trying to find that that fine line. I'm trying to inspire my students, but I'm also okay. want to have some direction. But if they have a better plan, I, I want them to to lead that way. Can you give some some specific examples where you worked with an adult <coughs> and they were able to take you through that path? Um, me personally, this year, um, I was not going to pick up the project no more, and I was going to end it last, last school year. But when I came back to the school, a lot of the kids were going to the administration, like, hey, is the group going to come back? Is the group going to come back? And then the administration came to me, and they were like, we need you, and we mm -hmm. need you to step back up and do this. Um, and they basically just encouraged me to keep working this year, um, but they didn't really step in to the projects. We would just bring it to them and they'll be like, okay, this is what you need to do. And they'll give us advice in the office, but they won't step out to the events. So that's a good one. Let's give a bad story. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty. Um, well, mm. You don't have to say names. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. Well, I have an example, not from my like, organization, but I guess from the, the history of the immigrant youth movement. So back in, I don't know, 2006, 2008, 2009, something like that, um, there was a, immigration reform was coming up for you know, discussion, whatever, in the, national, in the U.S. Senate, in the U.S. House. So there was a gathering of like, immigrant rights advocacy organizations, like the big established, like um, Neil Camargo's Voice, I forgot the other ones, but a whole bunch of organizations. Um, and so undocumented youth were invited to come to this meeting to, you know, like talk about what they saw as the next step in immigration reform nationally. Uh, but when the immigrant youth got there, like it turns out that only the, the adults were, you know, talking and strategizing and the immigrant youth were given a separate space to talk and strategize, which turned out to be the court room for them to like strategize or the adults were you know, strategizing in their room. So that's, that's a, a bad example, but they actually motivated the, <laughs> the founding of United We Dream, which is a national network of immigrant youth organizations 
I think it was there that the people who were there saw that, you know, we want, we want to be tokens, we want a seat at the table and actually have, you know, some input into what's going on instead of just being like trotted out in front of the cameras because we're, you know, the dreamers and people like us. So that's, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Some other bad examples. If this wasn't in uh, like a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, but I mean, I could talk about that too. There was one when we were planning our first speak out um, and we were talking about having it also be a fundraiser because as I've said, like, like young people, uh, we don't have a lot of resources. Um, and so this was really like a necessity for us to like fund directly our needs. Um, and you know, we ended up making that choice and you know, um, we brought it up at one of our meetings. And there were, I think, three or four people in the room who were um, like white, educated, well-employed, um, like had resources, who objected uh, and like really, really like made a made a, a big a big deal about like you know said something about um, commodifying our stories uh, to make money you know when really it was about like actually we just we need we need like we need this money. Um, and even like while they were saying, oh, you know, like I don't see young people in the room speaking up, like having just cut someone off um, who is trying to say, like I, like I need to buy groceries, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's something that happens a lot. Just and then, you know, like us in the room had to say, hey, you just you, like you cut our friend off. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was the reaction after that? Was there? We had follow-up conversations mm -hmm. um, individually with the folks. Um, they ended up coming to the event. Uh, I think a couple of them contributed. So, I mean, you know, it's like a, a line to walk, but. Because I think this is actually new terrain. Uh, some of the most effective organizations that I am seeing tend to be multi-generational. Um, this, there's a terrific group in Colorado uh, that is working on school to prison pipeline. And the adults, the PTA, the teachers couldn't do it without the students and vice versa to get the kind of leverage and clout. And they've passed legislation um, and they have a superintendent who has an accountability audit in concert with them. This is, to me is a very high level, sophisticated, effort for advocacy change. And I feel like you all are taking us there because as Jeremy says, the power of the rising generation. Um, I love social media for one reason alone. Young people are usually, stereotypical comment, are usually far better at it than most older people. So all of a sudden we have true superiority uh, based on generation. It's, it's a stereotype, but basically that's the case. So now adults are far more dependent on, okay, so how should we use Snapchat? You know, like what should we be doing? And that never, we didn't quite have that need. And adults are so clueless about this or intimidated. And you all, not that that's the be all end all, but you all have some, some power in that sort of skill set. Um, are there other areas where you feel you really can teach us? I think you've touched <clears throat> on it, um, like that our different organizations, multi-generational, um, like need each other. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether that be like technology, or, but I, I really think like you know like they they need our stories um, mm -hmm. and they need our like personalities, our power, um, our voices, our vision, um, and like we you know like we need theirs as well. Um, so. Thank you. I yes. Think, like multi-generational organizations, movements are also effective because like like said so they need those stories. They also need people who are, like, aren't burned out. I feel like that's a mm -hmm. terrible thing to say, but like, if you've been involved in a movement a, a long time, you, you might get like, burned out or like, disillusioned with everything. And I think having young people come in kind of like, reinvigorates you, like, re inspires you to keep fighting because you see people who are you know, like, passionate about what they do and like, springing up from the ground and they want to keep going, and that motivates you. 
know, that happened, that happened in my case when we have like, like, you know, high schoolers coming in and they're all, you know, excited, they want to keep fighting. And I'm like, yeah, we gotta keep fighting, let's do this. So it's very, yeah, it's more thing. Excellent. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Please jump oh, in. Sorry, I'm next. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. That's okay. So this isn't really like a question, but it's kind of like, I guess, an extended comment. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So like a person like me, I'm kind of, I have a lot of different ideas that I'd like to get out, and I'm not really sure if I'd like to start like an organization, like a nonprofit organization, or if I just want to join like other leaders who are kind of in the community. But how do you, like, what's your advice to people who they have like a love for different art forms, like they could make a film, they could write a book, they could do a lot of different things, but they're kind of having, they're struggling with what to do first. That's great. Please jump in. I would basically say do some research on the different kind of organizations that you're interested in, and then just go from there based on your research. Okay. That's what I would do. Link up with people who want to do the same sorts of things as you. So that kind of makes it difficult to stand like on your own if you're just, you know, because I don't mind joining, but at the same time, I don't want to just be like an add-on to someone else's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it can be very tricky, I think. Um, often people say eight people is a great number. Uh, you know, this idea that you need, um, you know, 30, 50 people. Uh, you really can become an advocacy engine with a small group, but I think you're right. Uh, try to find that first pistachio nut. Uh, you know, just get involved and see where it leads you, and then you're going to want a second pistachio nut. Okay. And I think Jeremy had a great line when we, we talked um, a couple weeks ago about how people are just waiting. They're waiting to get involved. And, you know, so. If you don't find an Isabel or a Montrell to connect with, please start. Just okay. start and see where it leads. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, should we go over here? Um, so I uh, feel like I'm seeing a lot more um, high school, act, like high school students as activists and organizers right now than, um, than when I was in high school. And so I have two questions related to that. One. Um, why? Like, why do you think that is that, that high school students, young people, particularly in this moment in in history, are um, are rising up? And then, two, I talked to someone who was in, recently who was involved in um, uh, in movements, social movements in the '60s, um, uh, civil rights, Black Power, anti-war, feminism, um, who was saying that yes, the the youth-led movements today are great, but they feel less um, connected across across different passions than the movement of the 60s, movements of the 60s did. And I wonder if you feel like that's true. Um, and if not, if you have any examples of places where these, your different movements are connecting. Great questions. Um, to answer the first question, I think we have a lot of youth activists because we're starting to realize a lot of these policies affect us directly and affect our future. So since we're realizing it, we feel the need to speak up. Um, I know for me it was that fear, like I could be next. So before it is me, I want to change the system and I want to change the laws and policies. Um, and to answer the second question, I agree. I do feel that we're not so much connected, but I think it's because a lot of the times we let our voices be heard between in the four, four walls and we don't actually get out there. Um, and there is a lot of people like me who are out there speaking against the issue, but I don't know about it because they're only speaking at their community and in their school. So until we're actually able to connect, then that's when we'll actually be able to be connected. I think, well, to answer the first question, why there seems to be more youth activism nowadays? Because like, when I was in high school, there really wasn't that much youth activism, even <coughs> like, 10 years ago. Um, but I think nowadays, because of social media, like young people grow up knowing that they have a voice, so that there's people out there who will listen to them. Whereas, like before social media, like something needed to happen to you for you to realize that you had a voice. But now it's just like the default position. Like you have a voice, you can put things out there on social media, and people will listen. Someone will listen to you. And I think knowing that someone will listen is the first step in, like becoming activated in the movement, I think. And for the second question, I think 
you are, I think you're right that the movements today are maybe less like intersectional than in the 60s, but I think there has been um, a big like push, yeah, like a big push to try to make all social movements more intersectional because people don't have just one identity, people have many identities. And I think in the immigrant rights movement especially, especially the immigrant rights youth movement, we're really trying to do this, especially bridging like immigrant rights with LGBTQ issues. Mm -hmm. um, because for example, um, if people are incarcerated, like, incarcerated but, like in immigration detention centers, immigration detention centers, centers, there's a big issue with like um, trans women being, you know, put in a novel, there should be in a violence happening. And um, there's also been repeated violence happening against trans women of color that's been happening a lot. And that's something that the immigrant youth movement is trying to, you know, also work on because it's something that affects all communities as well. Yeah. I will answer um, the second question. Um, the reason why I feel like there's no, um, the, the youth movements are not strong today compared to the 60s is because, I, like I said before, I think they lack unity. <clears throat> And unity is important. I mean, you got to separate the eagles and other things and just come together. And that's one thing they did in the 60s, whether you was white, black, young, a woman, man, they all came together and they got the goal done compared to today. People just want to be seen. Or, or, you know, if you're from your side of town, you're going to do what you want on your side and vice versa. And there's no kind of sense of unity because if there was, this whole room would be packed out full of youth organizations. Like I said, I've been a part of many. New Haven P Police Youth Explorer, NAACP, Student Council, a Boy Scout. So I mean, I could, I could go down a list, but like I said, it's down to unity if they really want to make things happen. Um, I mean, I'm thinking just like I was, I was looking again um, at the statistics and I just like want to go back to what you said. Um, like about the intersection of um, like queer rights and immigrant rights. Um, I was looking at the um, like statistics for like, there were 22 trans women murdered last year in 2015. And that's, you know, like not even, you know, probably not all of them are reported. Um, and just like, um, like the, the detention centers, like people being deported um, and just like how um, it's at the intersection that people face the most violence. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like really just what I'm thinking about right now. And well, I think the immigrant rights movement and the LGBT movement um, has been a really like recent development because I know that when I started, it really, there wasn't a sense of inter intersectionality of the movements. But since I've been involved in the last, I don't know, like six years really, like I really seen the movement as intentionally tried to like draw both issues together and I think it's been really successful. I think especially for a United We Dream, um, they have, they've really been trying to do this. Yeah, exactly. I don't have the right word to say, but they've been trying to advocate more on LGBTQ issues, especially with detention centers mm -hmm. and yeah. I think another thing we're seeing, which is part of the evolution of grassroots mobilizing too, is that um, it is much more co-led. It is not top down. Um, uh, you don't, you all are creating a different way of building those relationships and making decisions. And um, I think it's very different from the 60s in that regard because we really had singular leaders and it, it it was it was such a different time so i'm sorry please jump in thank you uh i'm a remnant from the movements of the 60s and 70s myself i'm really glad to hear the word movement it's really thrilling and i thank you for that uh, my comment or question that i'm interested in you know this election year is that and the polling suggests that there's a big difference between youthful voters and older voters. Uh, so I just thought maybe you could comment on that and what you think your influence on electoral politics will be this time and in the future. Thank you, great question. 
Uh, so there's this guy named Trump. Um, <laughs> um, what are you going to do? <laughs> More than that, though. <laughs> Uh, but but elections, how, how does it seem relevant? Uh, does it scare you? <laughs> I think this time around the elections have um, shined a light on a lot of the issues, mm -hmm. um, especially Mr. Trump himself um, with a lot of his comments. Um, he shined a light that racism is still around. He's um, shined a light that, you know, we have this mentality that needs to be broken down um and i think more so him has scared me because of his supporters um more so because if he does get into office it's like what will happen next with somebody like his mentality we can't let it happen and i think um us as young people um we need to speak up a bit more about um him I don't even know why we're considering him letting him run in the first place, but yeah. I think, well, for organization, we want to stay away from like electoral politics, I guess, but Trump has really ignited like a lot of passion in people because, like you said, he has shown that racism is still out there, not that anyone doubted it before, but that racism is still out there and that there's a lot of hate out there that people have. And I think the role that like, we want to have in the electoral politics is to create, like help in creating a culture where it's not acceptable for someone who's like mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. up in public and like say, or even feel those things, like that you want to, like the things that he said that, you know, Mexicans are rapists and other terrible things that he said. So we want to help in highlighting those things because we want to create a society where it's not acceptable mm -hmm. to, for people to do that anymore. I would have to say, um, I really don't know because I think it's just a mixture of picking one of the two evils because Hillary Clinton is okay, but her husband during his time as president created the um, most incarceration rates for African American people and among other people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a matter of which one you want in the White House. I think they both have some ideology that can be polished up towards the future, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's what I would have to say. Uh, making sure young people get out to vote. Yeah. Um, I've worked a lot with um, more local campaigns uh, and elections. Um, and I'm like, you know, I'm really like a proponent of um, like focusing on local issues um, where we can come together as a community and make a difference. Um, you know, in our immediate communities, um, and like just right now, um, this is like stepping away from um, the election question a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but as people may have heard <coughs> last night, uh, there was a brutal, brutal uh, mass shooting in Orlando, Florida. Um, 50 like, uh, queer people at a, at a club were, were killed. Um, and this isn't in the, a lot of the websites or like coverages that I've seen of it, but um, it was Latin night and um, the people who were on the poster representing the event where um, were trans, Latina, and black women of color. Um, they're trans women. Um, and just, like, I'm thinking about like, how 22 trans women were murdered last year um, and how our community is in crisis. Um, tomorrow, uh, the LGBTQ kickback is having a rally um, at the Amistad Memorial at 4 p.m. Um, we have to like mourn mm -hmm. um, and honor like the people that we've lost in this fight, um, as well as to like, you know, uh, not, you know, not allow ourselves to be to be hopeless and to continue organizing and fighting, mm -hmm. um, so that this doesn't happen again. Um, but mm -hmm. like, I like I woke up this morning. I wasn't surprised. I was <laughs> horrified. But mm -hmm. it is not does not surprise me that that is where we are at right now. We're just going to take um, a couple more questions, but I, I do want to just on the 
Um, we often ask high school students especially to really work on registering voters, mm -hmm. to get people out to the polls, to volunteer um, at polling sites. And um, I'm working um, in D.C. We have quite an intergenerational coalition uh, that has already gotten int legislation introduced to lower the voting age to 16 because the last plantation has no members of Congress. So they are going for 16-year-olds will have the right to vote for their city officials as well as the U.S. president. That will not happen this year. Uh, but in San Francisco, there will be a ballot initiative that allows 16-year-olds to vote for both all school board candidates as well as the mayor and board of supervisors. And in my state of Maryland, where we have full voting representation, um, we have two cities, Tacoma Park and Hyattsville, that have lowered the voting age. And voter turnout among 16-year-olds is double that of the adults. So if we open this up, we perhaps could have more young people actually getting involved at a much earlier age and boosting turnout for life. Um, so I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, I'm, okay. Well, I want to start off saying thank you for what you guys are doing. And my question is, um, advertising is important. So like, what's the, what, what, like, what advice do you have for other people who want to join this movement or start their own? Wait, so the advertising question and the how advertising and getting involved or starting your own. Yeah, like tips that you have for other people who want to join or want to start their own mm -hmm. social change movement. Well, I would have to say most organizations like my SCSU, NWCP, we have our Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, just like, you know, a typical young person. Um, you can look it up there and not just for us, but any organization for the most part, I would say. And um, word of mouth, too, is a popular one, obviously. If you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, go always pass the information. So that's what I would say. I think, well, actually, the way that Connections for Dreams started was through Facebook, kind of. So back in 2010, I knew that I wanted to, you know, create a space for undocumented youth here in Connecticut, but I couldn't find, I looked online for like, a lot of organizations that were working for the rights of undocumented youth, you know, but I couldn't find anything. So someone else suggested that I make a Facebook page called Connecticut Dream Act. Uh, the Dream Act uh, that was a federal piece of legislation that would have allowed undocumented youth to uh, adjust their status and legalize themselves. So I made a, a Facebook page called Connecticut Dream Act. And then through that page, someone in Boston saw the page and then realized that she knew someone who was undocumented in Connecticut who also wanted to start something in Connecticut. So then she connected us, and that's how Connections for Dream started, through Facebook. <laughs> but I think that, you know, I say we started through Facebook, but then it's really the, about the personal connection that comes into play. Because after we connected, like we met in person, like at a Starbucks, so we were just like four people around the table, and we made a decision to, you know, start, start something here in Connecticut so that undocumented youth and undocumented families would no longer live in fear. Um, so it's about, like advertising in the sense of like social media, that helps get the word out there, but then really building something that lasts is about personal connection. Um, so there, there's a balance between like broad-based outreach, like Kenya Plaza rule, and just like building connections with people. Because it's, you can have like a, a wide reach and have like a lot of people see your flyer, see you know, your Facebook or whatever, but that doesn't mean that people will get involved. And it's really, you gotta find like a, you know, a small group of community people to, to actually make the change that you want, and that's really all that you need to get started. And that's how we started. Yes. Hi, um, Addis Castillo, Executive Director of the Citywide Youth Coalition. Great. First of all, I want to tell you guys that I'm like, you guys brought me to tears in my chair. Um, Cause, um, no. I think people have a misconception and perception that you guys are to future leaders, when I think, what I'm looking at is leaders today. Absolutely. You guys are leading now. And, yeah, right. and I 
have to piggyback on something that was brought up earlier about how do you unify a movement? <coughs> how do you bring folks together? And um, the coalition, and for instance, for me at least, we, we really build ourselves on this model, an African proverb, if you will. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Yeah. So that being said, um, one of the things that as a provider, someone who's been doing this work for over 20 years, it's really hard to get adults to get together and collaborate. Yes. And I've heard wise leaders once say that when you don't have collaboration, what you have is confusion and competition. So that being said, I think you guys are in a position to teach the adults what collaboration and partnership could really look like. That being said, how do I bring you guys to this table of this network that we're trying to build so that we can unify movements across the state so that eventually we can have national level impact? What Kickback is doing, we want to be a part of. What the Connecticut Dream Act is doing, we want to be a part of. I'm already working with Montreal and Jeremy as it is, but the reality is as I see all of you guys together, yeah. what I see is four individual leaders. What I would like to see is four joint leaders for people who actually have relationship outside of this stage. But then when you have fellowship and you start working together, you build trust. And then you can stop working in silos and be much more impactful. So I say this you know, quickly to move out the way and let somebody else speak. You are not the leaders of tomorrow, but the leaders of exactly. right now. Exactly. So please don't let anyone tell you that you're not being impactful, because right now you're moving me. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, I would like to be there to support you because you need to be leading us. Yes. Please go ahead. <coughs> Where do you hope for your organizations to be in 10 to 20 years? And another question is, how can you get attention for young people like me? Like, how do you come across? Where do you go to get your word spoken? Um, me personally, for my group within the next 10 years, um, hopefully grow into a nonprofit. Um, that's really the goal that I'm reaching for. Um, as far as getting young people involved, for me it's been going into the schools myself and sitting down with them and listening to their voices and then tell them, hey, you can come work with us and we'll let your voice be heard. I think for me, um, the two questions like how do you find the space and where I want my organization to be are sort of the same. Um, I want to, like, and this is definitely in sooner than 10 years, but have an established space, like be providing mm -hmm. arts educational, um, <coughs> like uh, organizing leadership, mentoring type of thing, um, and like be all over the city, um, and like be a space and a resource for young people, um, and you know, as well as everybody else. Well, as for me, in 10 years, I plan on becoming an attorney and helping younger organizations and people, you know, assisting with their legal assistance in any way to um, help society become a better place. I think in 10 years, I want, like, Connections for Dream to be, like, a nonprofit. We're already working on that, but it's a long process. We want to be, like, I want us to be a sustainable organization. And, like, most importantly, I think I want the organization to have, like, a a leadership pipeline in the sense that we have like a, a community organizing leadership development and political education curriculum where we have like training set up like several times a year where we can train youth and you know, train young people on community organizing skills on you know, political education so that we keep more people coming in and like developing the leadership and like making change out in the world. Um, and like how you get people to listen to you. I was gonna say exactly what you said, like going to school, talking to people, and letting them know that you, know, you do have a voice and your voice can be heard. I think that's how you, how you reach people. Yes, please go ahead. Um, um, hello, I just want to ask, I'm, I'm 14, so I was wondering, I'm getting to that age where I feel I can start doing, fulfilling a goal I had, which is making a difference, which I'm sure like all of you are doing. Um, I've missed, a portion of the lecture, so excuse me for that. I want to ask, how would someone who's growing up to be this, like this, um, would get the knowledge of knowing like social change and such, of what you are all work working for? Um, me, me, I started when I was 13. Um, so I had to do a lot of research myself on the issue 
um, and how I could get out there myself. Um, and then once I did the research, I connected with an adult or another student where we could team up and it's like, hey, I did this research, you did that research, now let's put it together and actually set up a plan to move forward. And with that, um, we've got Jeremy to close us out um, with um, a final uh, spoken word. Do you have a quick question? Please. Oh, this is awesome. That's good. Oh, would you like yes. to come up and speak <coughs> here? So it's a youth summit, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Superintendent Garth Harries, um, and I've been here and been as attentive as I can be with, yeah. with this one. Three quick and overlapping thoughts based on what I've <laughs> based on what I've heard. Um, you know, first of all, the, the question of what animates student movements now. <laughs> my hope as an educator um, is that we understand that at least one of those, the civil rights issue, was a great animator of youth energy. I hope we come to understand that the school systems that we operate today are set up for a fundamentally different purpose than they need to. They're not set up to serve all students. Right. And that, for me, is worthy of a social change that youth need to be part of. School systems are set up to sort students, some to go to college, some not to. Um, a related, and that should be a cause of great outrage uh, among students. Uh, a related thought um, is that our education cannot only be about academics. So I'd actually flip the question here, how can youth be part of uh, a change in activism agenda? I think every student needs to take yes. on leadership, right? If we are not training leadership, then we are not training people to be successful in the modern world. Um, and that's something that um, certainly for this one, uh, <laughs> already asserting and that, and that I know as a new father is what's most important to me, is his ability to operate as, as a leader. Kristen, how about that, huh? <laughs> Persistence. That's right. And, and that is the final point, right, is to understand that as difficult as these issues are, change takes time. I'm a 40-year-old superintendent. By some standards, that young, that's young. By some, it's old. Um, but the, what I know is that change takes time, and we have to build from the positive. And we have to recognize... Uh, as I, when I took him outside, that failure is yeah. part of learning, failure is part of leading. <laughs> and by the, by the end of one of our breaks, he made it up the stairs in one <laughs> shot. So, um, you know, I, I, I do in New Haven Public Schools, we want to celebrate student leadership. We want it to be part of every student's experience. Yes. Some will be more active socially than others, but everyone needs to carry that from their experience in New Haven Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bravo. And Jeremy, take us out. Um, so this piece is titled Shoes slash The Struggle Continues. Um, shoes that one day picked cotton off the hot fields. Shoes that one day rode along in the bus boycott. Shoes that one day walked down the street to Selma. Shoes that one day entered the White House as the first black president. Shoes that have been handed down, handed down generation after generation. Shoes that my generation wears today. Shoes that will not let me give up at the face of racism, that will not let me give up at the face of sexism, that will not let me give up at the face of classism. These shoes, they lead me down a hard path to endure, but these shoes will not let me give up without making a change, without letting me actually reach equality and equity. These shoes are hard to walk in, but I have the right example to follow in. Thank you.